Good afternoon and welcome to Learn with a Leader, a partnership event hosted by AOB and Neighbor Up as a part of Common Ground and the Cleveland Foundation's annual meeting week. My name is Tom O'Brien and I am the Director of Neighborhood Connections and I'm proud to be here today to introduce you to Neighbor Up and IOB and to our two wonderful moderators. This session is a unique opportunity for us to bring together people who have worked with both organizations to share what they have learned about taking an idea from inspiration to action and what it takes to raise funds, create networks, and build networks of neighbors to make change. I'm honored to introduce you to our two moderators, women who have helped hundreds of neighbors do great work. First, Don Arrington. Dawn is the Cleveland Action Strategist with IOB. Dawn is a wonderful organizer and strategist who has been with IOB for years and also is one of the founding members of the Neighbor Up Network. IOB stands for In Our Backyards, but it also stands for taking care of each other, for civic participation, and for trusting neighbors to know what's best for their neighborhood. IOB gives local leaders the ability to crowdfund the resources they need to be, build real, lasting change from the ground up. Their crowdfunding platform helps connect local leaders with support and funding from their communities to make our neighborhoods more sustainable, healthier, greener, more livable, and more fun. They've been a great partner with Neighborhood Connections and with the Neighbor Up Network, and I'm Glad uh, to be able to introduce Dawn today. Erica Brown is the co-network manager with the Neighbor Up Network. Erica is a great organizer and wonderful trainer and facilitator. She has been with Neighbor Up for the past five years. Neighbor Up is a network of over 3,000 members throughout Greater Cleveland, people working together through love and power across lines of difference working together on issues they care about and support each other. From getting to know their neighbors on their street, to creating a community mural, to addressing issues around reducing infant mortality for black and brown mothers, increasing funding opportunities in the arts for people of color, or hiring local residents to full-time jobs with benefits at neighborhood institutions. A group of residents from Cleveland and East Cleveland also steward a small grants program that has funded over $10 million, provided $10 million in funding to over 3,000 grassroots groups in the cities of Cleveland and East Cleveland. Both Don and Erica are from Cleveland, live in Cleveland, work in Cleveland, and are dedicated to creating a more just, equitable, and inclusive community. So with that, I'd like to thank you all for being here, and I'd like now to hand it over to Don and Erica to introduce our incredible panel. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Don. And so I'm going to introduce the panel. So we're going to start with introductions, and then we're going to get into um, the questions for this morning, afternoon. Um, but just a very brief introduction for everyone on the panel. Um, so first, uh, Xin Wen Sui is a Midtown resident, Asia Town Community Organizer with Midtown Cleveland Incorporated, Program co Coordinator with the Community Innovation Network at Case Western Reserve University, and also facilitator for the Asia Town Sweethearts Project uh, because the moms were the actual project managers. <laughs> Angela Trevisano, is a resident of Ohio City, J Avenue. Malaz El Jamiabi is a Sudanese designer who is also a resident of Ohio City. Julian Khan is a resident of our Buckeye neighborhood in Cleveland and also a community organizer. Thank you. I will turn it over to Dawn for our first question. Well, um, we are going to have all of our panelists talk about uh, their projects. Uh, so we'll do it in the order of um, 
introductions. So, Sheen, if you could, um, would you please introduce, uh, again, your name uh, and what's your connection to the neighborhood or to the project? Um, and um, just tell us about, like, the challenge or that you were addressing and or, like, the, uh, the assets that you were upholding um, for your project. And then we'll move on to Angelo and Malaz and then round it out with Julian. Sure. Thank you. Um, before I start it, and it's lunchtime, if you are in front of a screen, please follow me. Uh, just going to warm it up. And please send me some energy and also send some love to the moms in the Asia town. Thank you. Um, yes, uh, so my name is Xin Yuancui, and I'm a friend and a member of Neighbor, uh, Neighborhood Connection. Um, so Asia Town Sweetheart is a resident self-organized community initiative about baking and sharing. It's a play on the words of Chinese translation of the word. And as a COVID-19 response, it brought love and hope to the community and also helped us, the Asia Town team, to build trust relationship with the residents from the ground. And also, this is the first community project that was initiated by and for the Asia Town residents. Um, so I actually started serving as a community, community organizer in Asia Town in January this year. Um, to build a strength community connection with Asia Town residents. However, when I began, there was only two residents on the contact list. Please remember this significant number. And right after I started, COVID-19 just came to Cleveland. And I was like, how am I going to build relationship with residents and with this physical distance? And as an immigrant community, Asia Town has been adversely affected by the pandemic. Um, when COVID-19 was first reported in China in late February, Asia Town community were facing discrimination and xenophobia. And we worked with our partners to stand against this rising anti-Asian racism and start community pandemic response work through WeChat, which is a popular social media platform in Chinese immigrant community. Um, and soon we figure out when residents are facing unemployment and all may they may not be able to claim unemployment insurance. There are language barriers, fear of being an Asian immigrant, and the needs for food just adding additional challenge to the community. So me and my team, we've been working day and night just to gather and translate all the information, how people in the community can get news and resources they need in the community. Um, so in early May, when I was checking on my WeChat, I saw some posts about baking desserts from residents, and they don't know each other. I reached out to them and I asked if you want to share your baking talent with the community. And at that time, that was I discovered the start of Neighbor Up a nineteen Rapid Response Grant. So the mom recognized the meaningfulness of sharing and community care during this difficult time. So we create a group chat. The four moms just start to throw their ideas in their chat and work with me and Karis, who is our Asia Town project manager and also rock star, and apply this grant, which is for thousands, and we were selected and received the full funds. Um, with my facilitation, we um, uh, start our first meeting in May. 11th, uh, so Asia Town Sweetheart just officially launched. And it just only take the moms only one month to complete the project. So over the weekend of June 13th and June 20th, they made 280 traditional ch uh, Chinese uh, Chinese desserts. One is taro pastry, another one is Chinese sponge cake because the moms said they are the elders and the kids in the community, they will love it the soft cakes. And we got eight volunteers help us to deliver those desserts and also care packages, which includes things like masks, gloves, and also encouraging notes to 150 registered residents and workers and 26 small businesses in Asia Town. Because of this effort, our Asia Town team now connected over hundreds of residents and also developed a list that is over 350 uh, people on our WeChat. And I remember at our debrief call, um, yes, from two to 350, that's an amazing number. Um, remember at the debriefing call, and the moms were sharing about their life, introduced about their kids, and showing their fishing moment at Lakefront. 
because compared to the first meeting call, I was the only person that opened the camera, and that was really awkward. Um, and now they were planning where to hang out after COVID. Uh, apparently, there are so many challenges during the, uh, the project, but I say the most challenging one is the moms. They don't believe they can do it. So one of the moms said, I never know, like I can use my talent to do things for my community or there wasn't a community organizer ever reached out. Um, so me and my carers, we did provide a lot of community support. As I mentioned before, we have been working to gather and share COVID-19 related information with the community and they were touched by the work we are doing even though we met each other through internet but the mom said this person is so strange and i don't even know what she's talking about but the tangible work we're doing that helps build this trusting relationship between us and moms we believe in them and the vice versa like they know they are not going to do this by themselves and also was a moment when we well, we know that neighborhood connection grant committee decided to support this project. The moms feel, oh, this is a moment where their dream initiative become real. So they feel empowered and encouraged because it's the first time they ever applied for the community grant and they got it. And I would say the last touching stone was because the moms know how much their kids love the, the dessert they baked. And so when the moms, they bake for community, like they are baking for their kids. One of the moms who works in the local restaurant shared with me said, I would love to be part of this project because helping others has proven my value in my life and I have been helped. Thank you. Thank you. That was beautiful. Uh, Malaz, Angelo, you're up next. Uh, hi everyone, uh, my name is Malaz El Jumiavi and I'm a Sudanese uh, designer and resident of Ohio City and I came to learn to, um, to be part of this community um, last year when I um, worked as the architect and designer for the Riverview Community Center and um, I completely fell in love with the neighborhood and the residents after this long engagement process um, to talk about the design. Uh, many of them I call now my friends and uh, a lot of these friends live in a, right across the street from me now who are uh, senior citizens at one of uh, CMHA uh, housing uh, facilities, Riverview Towers. Um, so during when this pandemic um, happened, it was, we know all that the most vulnerable uh, group was senior citizens. And having been in contact with many of the residents throughout uh, the projects that we did before, but also as community member afterward, we wanted to, to really do something to help uh, our most vulnerable groups. So we reached out to our neighbors at Riverview Towers and um, shout out to Brian Mallory, who's not here, I think, um, who is a resident of Riverview, to identify the needs of the residents and to come together with uh, a care package that can address their most immediate needs, but also um, communicate at most the care and love and support from the wider Ohio City community to its um, senior residents. So we put together a care package to the 500 uh, residents of Riverview that included the hygiene uh, kit that had uh, uh, bleach, soap, and uh, gloves, as, um, as well as a, a food kit that had sort of like a, a, a non-perishable items that would be um, sufficient for at least a few days before someone needs to go out and um, or uh, another source of food um, can be uh, available for them. Uh, the last kit which we had was a fun kit now, um, this was very important because a lot of the residents were talking about feeling lonely and isolated 
during the pandemic now that they are all confined, mostly confined into their own um, apartments, which are like one, one bedroom apartment. So it's a single person living there most of the time. So we wanted something that could also be uh, used to, um, to entertain them. So we created these coloring pages that are Ohio themed and uh, Cleveland theme, theme, coloring pages and with crayons, as well as word puzzles and uh, Sudokus. We, and we asked these uh, from the residents, what do they do to have fun? What, what are the things that sort of like entertain them? So we created that um, package and um, with the help of the residents. So the whole idea started with a group of residents discussing this and a week, within a week, we set up the IOBI campaign to raise fund. Our target was to raise about three thousand uh, dollar for the kind of like the initial target, and we started the campaign on Thursday evening, like about eight p.m. Right before I was putting my son to sleep, I was like, okay, let me just start the campaign. Put on the community group. This is what we need. And we anticipated that we're going to have us like it's going to take us a week to do uh, fundraising, maybe of that amount, and then another week or sometimes to actually assemble the kit. And by Friday afternoon, we raised the full amount. It was an explosion of community support. It was amazing, very heartwarming to see how many people during such difficult time where we know everyone is struggling, everyone is strained um, to show that um, depth of, of uh, support and, and speed. So we had to figure everything on Friday afternoon to be able to deliver all of the, uh, the packages on Tuesday with the, with the, um, the, the mobile a food bank that um, goes to that area so the residents don't have to come out of their apartment twice. So we thought, how can we partner with the local food bank to, to do the delivery on the same day? So on Friday afternoon, we had to get 500 items of each thing. And uh, we went to the local, our local um, supermarket, Dave's, that provided us with all the food. Uh, we sort of like rushed, we ordered few things um, that are like the hygiene kits, the coloring pages, and we just set up the tables outside my house and um, where neighbors just came by. We had like an assembly line that you had doctors coming in after their shift and before they even like take rest, they came straight out and they start like this, working on this assembly line. We had children uh, working and helping us as well from the neighborhoods. And that's all on one street, which is J, J Street. Um, we had people who took some of the items like bleach to do 500 uh, bleach uh, cups in their houses and bring it over. It was just an amazing how things, how the whole community kind of like showed up to finish everything. And then the most amazing part is we kept receiving funds even though we reached our target, we kept receiving funds. So as we are receiving funds, we are adding more and more items as we keep, like, as the generosity of the community um, comes in. So we started then thinking of adding a, a face mask, face mask, reusable face mask to the 500 residents. And we got the, the masks from the local uh, nonprofit, which is Refugee Response, that is right next to the uh, building, that like next to the Riverview um, Towers. And those masks were made by Afghani women, refugees, that, the, the, that are within the neighborhood and the organization serves. So we ended up having most of the donation comes back to the community, whether in supporting local businesses and local food businesses, or also supporting local nonprofits that are working to support other residents as well. So we had all of this um, closed circle work. And on, on Tuesday, um, CMHA um, helped us deliver all the 500 uh, packages, care packages to the residents with, um, with the art, with uh, the hygiene and the food kits. And I wanna really thank Angelo 
my kind of team uh, made in this for making uh, really big moves to get us uh, to where we are. And I want him to talk about that as well, because a lot of the success we had comes from um, working together to make sure that this initiative is, um, it's, it's successful to the way it was. It was like mind blowing to the whole community how, how this was a, an amazing community for effort. So it wasn't just me or it wasn't like a two people. It was maybe started as an idea, but it was really a, a full community effort. Hey I'm Angelo Carasano, uh, neighbor of Malaz, local busybody. Um, Malaz nailed it with the description, described everything. I just got to give a shout out to Iobi, who had all the matching funds. We wouldn't have been able to raise so much money so quickly if it wasn't for them, for their help, for staff at Iobi. Another shout out to Dave's Supermarkets. Uh, no other store, I don't think, could have immediately ordered in less than 24 hours more than $2,500 worth of canned food. Um, and help they actually moved it themselves with their employees from the Dave's Market on Bridge Avenue over to Malaz's home on J1 Street over. Um, and so they were incredibly helpful. Dean Supply was incredibly helpful. Big shout out to them. Um, and then all the dozens of people in Ohio City who really stepped up and contributed quickly without hesitation. They even forwarded on our email asks. Um, you know, still today, but even more so then, people were looking for some way to make it positive impact. You know, it was such a scary time with the outbreak just starting. Um, everyone kind of knew that, you know, with so many vulnerable people and older people in Riverview um, all together in the Riverview Towers that we needed to make an impact. We wanted to reduce the number of trips to the store for like a couple rolls of toilet paper or just simple little things. So we really tried to include in our care package, you know, everything that would be needed to keep people home just a couple more days, you know, cause we really wanted to flatten the curve that was in the mode all of us were in. Um, but, but yeah, and then just helping make Malaz's vision a reality as fast as possible and to just help get through all these little decisions that needed to be made very quickly. And I'm just happy to help and happy that we can help Brian Mallory. Uh, he just deserves so many shout outs for being so helpful in this too. Thank you. Thank you so much, Malas. Thank you, Angelo. Um, so, so here's the thing. Y'all answered like two extra questions already. So I'm going to go back. Yeah, Julian to, hasn't introduced himself. So I'm going to go back to Julian. That's what I'm saying. I'm going to go back to Julian to finish his introduction. <laughs> okay. And then we'll move into the next question. <laughs> um, hey there. Um, my name is Julian Kahn. Um, the, uh, uh, I'm working in the uh, Buckeye neighborhood that uh, I was uh, born, raised in, called home to this day, and um, it's just really the center of any of my feelings and so on and so forth. Um, um, about five or six years ago, I uh, started something called the, uh, um, what's it called? The uh, Buckeye Summer Soul Series with a group of neighbors uh, in Buckeye. And um, so we started uh, that about five or six years ago, and it's uh, – in the most general sense, it's a uh, series of block parties with community resource uh, elements. Uh, we wanted, um, number one, we were uh, trying to recapture some of the magic from the uh, Buckeye Festival. It used to be like a really big event at, at its height. It felt like a, uh, a homecoming to the neighborhood. And I felt like we had lost uh, a space where uh, people from 128th would be able to intersect with folks from 115th and this and that. So, you know, it, just trying to address some of the schisms that exist in the social bubbles and really trying to uh, trying to capture the uh, the feeling of a uh, of a much larger community because uh, you know we're all in this together and we're all neighbors whether we know it or not and uh, so um, it started with two events and then somehow or another it just kind of culminated into like eight maybe eleven events so on and so forth and uh, so last year was the first year that we uh, had a Juneteenth event. Um, and uh, we felt that was necessary because uh, it marked 400 years uh, since the uh, first um, um, uh, ships uh, that had uh, enslaved people uh, that were carrying enslaved folks to this country. Uh, it was the f marked 400 years since that first uh, boat had, had come here. So, um, you know, the conversation uh, amongst different social bubbles just felt like very progressive and it felt like that was a common denominator, like it was all, often referenced. So I felt like this was something that we had to commemorate. And, uh, you know, four or five years in, 
I felt like we had to had a master people power and the um, um, and, and and just a uh, um, a general review on uh, on on our events that you know if we offered something like this that it would at least garner some interest and people would show up and show out and um, so that was the first year that we did it and uh, you know standing on those shoulders we were able to do something this year against all odds I know a. Uh, COVID has really presented a great uh, challenge to a lot of us as far as organizing in traditional capacities or whatnot, but um, somehow or another, we were able to pull this off. And, um, um, you know, I, I, I don't think any one person could take credit of any, for anything that, that's of this large scale. Um, all that I can say is, uh, much like Angelo said, I'm just kind of a hyper omnipresent type of person. I'm in a lot of different conversations at the same time. And um, this year's event was kind of the... Uh, um, the results of just being in a lot of different conversations about what can we do this year. Um, so um, I was uh, just meeting with the NAACP about um, uh, potentially doing a, a, a month, uh, something to commemorate Juneteenth. Of course, uh, you know, I'm always biased when people are talking with me, I'm always going to uh, say, why not Buckeye? And uh, so um, they uh, didn't shoot that idea down. Um, um, uh, shout out to Jennifer Lumpkin. She connected me with someone, uh, Asia Jones, who was looking to uh, put together her own Juneteenth event. And uh, she was just going to do it by herself. And, um, uh, you know, I got a chance to talk with her that same day. And um, I was so moved by uh, by her, her willingness to go about this on her own. And uh, I thought that that was something that we really need to harness. And we also need to support as well. I mean, we have a structure here and we have place and we have folks that can really help you. And, and there's no reason to do anything by yourself, you know, and uh, we're all going to be stronger together if, if we're able to bring all this intentionality and, and these, um, these ideas and, and visions and whatnot together. And uh, so she was able to come on board. And um, we were also talking with folks to neighbor up, uh, Selena Pagan, and, and then also, um, Jennifer Lumpkin as well about uh, um, kind of replicating something that they had done on the West side, which was a caravan, which uh, promoted um, 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 not only distribution of uh, PPE, uh, which is, you know, obviously critical, but um, census participation and then also voter registration as well. And uh, so that was another component that we were able to add on because it had existed before, but we were able to fine tune it and ensure that it was culturally relevant for the neighborhood as well. And, um, so honestly, it was a, it was a lot of conversations to, to make this uh, thing happen. Um, a, a good friend of ours, Marvin Cross, was able to kind of connect with the police and was able to facilitate that. Uh, I was almost in every single one of these conversations with small conversations, small group conversations, just to extend that transparency to the other small groups that may not have been privileged to hear. You know, the, the work, some of this stuff was moving so rapidly. There weren't any notes. There weren't. So I was the note taker, you know, and um, so I just was uh, kind of playing the, the, uh, the, the messenger role and, and ensuring that everyone had that was on one accord and was moving forward. And um, they weren't, um, you know, siloed in, in their uh, in their conversations around this day. Um, the day uh, started with a, a freedom walk from uh, Benedictine, which uh, ended at the uh, Trumpet Man statue at uh, 118th and Buckeye. Uh, that's also known as the Art and Soul Park. That's, um, that's also the site of our uh, last year's Juneteenth event. So there was uh, also some uh, significance to that space. And um, um, the city has been a great partner in just upkeeping that space for programming um, purposes, just based off of some of the, the, um, the work that we've been doing there. So um, just thinking about how this work has so many like different ripple effects or whatnot. Um, it's ensuring now that, you know, that people can go there and a little shindig there if they so choose, you know. Um, um, but uh, once it culminated there, um, we had some speakers uh, just kind of speak to the, to the uh, magic of the moment and the spirit of the moment. Uh, we had uh, uh, local vendors, um, um, uh, all socially distant, of course, uh, across the street. Uh, and we took up the entire parking lot. So we took about five or six feet between each one of us and just kind of formed a circle in a neighborhood fashion. And uh, we were, uh, everybody sold out, to be honest with you. So that was also a testament to um, 
um, the spirit of that day and the intentional patronage to a lot of those small uh, vendors, uh, folks were able to get their products on TV as a direct result of that as well, you know, and, um, you know, really presented a lot of different opportunities for folks to collaborate and then also to get their products out there to markets that they wouldn't otherwise have access to. Um, in addition to that, we also had uh, healthy food samples, uh, PPE distribution. We had the uh, caravan that, uh, caravana that went through the neighborhood. We had a, a convoy of Jeeps. Um, shout out to that Jeep club. There was about 20 or so Jeeps that uh, showed up and, and really just get an event and really just um, um, create a, a, a figurative red carpet for folks who might have been on a 126 and might not have known what was going on on 118th. And um, so that really, um, I felt like that was one of the, uh, um, for me, the highlight of it was just seeing everyone just kind of honoring their roles and um, and just um, really just making it stay really super impactful and just ensuring that it, it was able to reach just a multitude of folks across the spectrum, uh, and, and however you want to look at it. I mean, we had so many different photos where there were kids who were engaged. We had uh, chalk paint and freedom houses and all sorts of stuff. I still have my chalk paint here. Um, I'm thinking of a creative message to uh, paint with it still, but um, you know, I, I saw after the fact there were kids on my street, three, four year olds who were, um, you know, trading paints and, and still were uh, kind of beautifying the neighborhood. So, again, just um, it was one thing. The day was one thing, but um, the ripple effects and just have just being afforded to, to exist in the space and just kind of see how that day just really invigorated people, how people felt the love in that day. And, um, you know, it's really a testament to all of the work and, and the networks that we've been able to build throughout the years. And um, um, you know, I'm looking forward to next year already. Thank you, Julian. Thank you, all of you. So those are great introductions. Thank you for talking about the collaborations and the relationship building and how you use your existing networks and connect it to other networks. Um, one quick question I want to ask um, both for uh, Sheen and also for Julian um, Malaz and Angelo talked about how they were, their goal was originally $3,000 and through their crowdfunding platform, um, they were able to raise that in the day and then continue to raise money after that. Um, so if each of you in turn, uh, Sheen first and then Julian, if you could answer the question about, you know, how much money were you looking to get? How much were you granted or did you raise um, for your project? Oh. Sure. Uh, for Asia Tales to be hard, we aim for 4,000 and we got the full funds. I'm sorry, one more time. We got the full funds. And what was the full amount that you were looking for? 4,000. 4,000. Thank you. And Julian? Um, my answer to that question is a little bit more complicated um, because we had three different pots that we were, uh, for this specific event, uh, that we were um, kind of pulling from. So the NAACP um, helped out with their uh, aspect of the of the day. Um, Neighbor Up uh, helped with their aspect of the day. And uh, Buckeye Summer Soul Series, which we have funds that um, Neighbor Up contributes to uh, uh, on a perennial basis. Uh, thankful for that contribution. And uh, so we still had some funds from last year that we were able to dip into. And um, um, we were able to help to provide or supplement the uh, the entire day with uh, entertainment or whatnot. Um, but um, the, the foundation of those funds all come from the reason that we even got funding for events with, thanks to crowd matching or uh, crowd fund matching for uh, climate uh, um, climate uh, events. I think we did zero waste that year on uh, some of the neighbor uh, uh, on some of the block parties on some of these neighboring streets or whatnot. So um, anything that we had in the pot was amassed from neighbor up in Iobi. Um I couldn't give you a hard figure, um, but uh, um, yeah, it just helped uh, having three different folks and people bringing their own money into, into the game too. It really helped to alleviate some of the burden. Um, Thank you. Don? Yeah, Angelo, uh, really quickly, do you remember the final amount that you all raised? About $8,500. Yeah, yeah, and they were a part of a match. And Julian, you were part of the uh, Climate Action Fund um, match when you did the summer Buckeye Soul Series. I never get it right. 
and those Jeeps were amazing. I'm a Buckeye resident, and so it was a very happy day. I didn't stop. I just drove through, and I was like, I can't get through because there's all these Jeeps on the street, but it was amazing um, just to see them. Um, so I'm going to move on to a question because, like, this is about taking action, and this is about building something from the ground up, you know, and um, – you know, addressing a challenge, an issue, and or uplifting and upholding um, assets in your community. Um, because I don't think everything is about a challenge or should be about challenge. We should also be celebrating um, the beauty in our neighborhoods as well. And so I do want to talk about either an unexpected challenge that you faced and or a learning that you gained from the process of getting things done. Um, and so I'll start with um, Malaz and Angelo on this. Like, you know, it could be something as simple as like mail and having things delivered or whatever it is. But, you know, just this unexpected challenge that, uh, that you may have faced. Um, and what did you do to work through that? Well, I mean, uh, like I mentioned before, it's a good problem, I guess. We did raise the money the, within less than 24 hours and probably less than um, 12 hours. Uh, well, yeah, 24 hours. So one of the challenges was how can we move quickly and, um, and really get assemble everything um, we need uh, within this very, very, very short time. And the way I see it, that it was solved, is by including everyone in that issue. So when we went to Dave's, for example, and we said we need to, or we have this amount of food and we need to order and we need to get, they were problem solving with us. They were like, okay, then the guy, the, the, the manager of Dave said, well, I have a truck. It's my personal truck and I can bring it. And then the, the guys who works there, they were like, well, we can unload and upload things. And we were looking for a location and for us to work. My house is very close to Dave's. And I said, okay, let's bring it into my house. And, and so have my office, I have my office in, um, part of the house as well so it becomes the the solution to where we are going to keep all these things and then um to to problem solve uh, even about where to where to buy some of the other stuff like that how can you get 500 times four because we had well we we had the five uh, four rolls of toilet paper in each package and Jessica, who's Angel's wife, was like, "Have you looked at this place? Um, what was it? What was it called?" Dean Supply. Dean Supplies, yes. And it was very affordable, and they had the amount, so we went there. But then it was such a large amount to get in one day. But they worked out with us about like, okay, we need it. What um, uh, we did the order online on Friday. We had to pick it up on Saturday. And who's going to do that? So a community member said, well, I have a truck. We can use my, my truck. So he, he's the one transported all of this stuff. Um, we had, as we add items, we, are, we keep thinking about how can we do it. And it's, it was just a lot of resources and, and, um, and solutions came from the people who are contributing um, to this. And sometimes we reached out to um, our online community, our online group, like wider high city community to say that, well, we need clients. What do we do? Where can we get some, so someone will suggest some, something like, can you contact local restaurants who are closed at the moment and might have a supply laying around for that? Or someone might say, well, I have some uh, crayons from uh, teaching or school or like materials, I can bring them to you. So we had um, a lot of this sort of like a community um, problem solving process that came. And I don't know, Angel could also add to that. Every single aspect of our project, I feel like was, it was scary, you know, and there wasn't a clear choice. We kind of just had to figure out what are our options. Let's pick the best one, execute, move forward. Uh, 
everything that Malasha said, you know, like, okay, we, we actually ordered $2,500 worth of food from days before we had the money. So we kind of needed to pray and be like, okay, we need to at least raise that much. I go to pick it up. Like Visa declines the purchase because they think it's fraud who buys $2,500 at a grocery store. So I'm like, oh, it was just constantly overcoming these different challenges. But, but we knew what we wanted to do. We were absolutely certain what needed to happen. And we were all willing to pull out any stops that were required to make this project happen. So it was just constantly managing all of these difficult challenges. And we pulled it off because we had the full support and backing of the entire community. And that's what, that's what made it possible. Oh my God, the, the, the visa declining, that sounds like super scary. Um, <laughs> uh, Julian, how about you? Uh, unexpected challenge or um, learning from the whole process? Um, I would say a lot of it was due to our short uh, timetable and like preparing this thing. I think we might have started out maybe three and a half, three weeks out from the actual uh, date. Um, so just because we had so many different moving pieces, it was like, I, I would liken it to like a, a watch or something. There were a lot of like very small group conversations that were just hyper-focused on certain aspects of this. Like, um, who's going to make sure that who's doing the healthy food dem uh, demonstrations, who's doing this and that doing, and, um, three weeks really isn't the ideal amount of time. Uh, it's right on par for what we normally do for the Soul Series. So I'm not really arguing with it that much. I think last year we might have started out two weeks in advance. So, eh, you know, it's par for the course. But, um, you know, in the grand scheme of thing, I would not recommend that to uh, to anyone else. You know, definitely plan with enough time. So especially if you have all these small uh, bits and pieces that really kind of bring uh, come together and form like Voltron and make this, you know, this large thing that we're talking about today. But uh, for me, it was that. And then also coordinating with police. Um, when we think about the uh, just that time, uh, if we want to bookmark that, this was post uh, George Floyd protest. And, you know, um, one of the uh, things that uh, I was most proud of for last year's Juneteenth event was that that was the one instance where we did not have any police presence. So it dramatically changed who felt welcome to that, uh, to that event versus who feels welcome, who's, you know, um, at some of the block parties where, um, you know, police presence is mandated uh, because of the um, um, the block party permits that the city creates, right? So um, I'm just trying to kind of walk that fine line because that was something we hung, hung our hat on for last year's event. Uh, but obviously, we're not just going to take to the streets and, you know, and, and uh, so we uh, and, and do a march without police, you know, and uh, um, so um, just finding that fine intersection where people felt supported but they didn't feel like their space was being infringed upon and that they were able to just uh, wholly be in, in, in the presence and really feel the joy and, and, and the, um, and the, and the light from each one of uh, the neighbors and the folks that were there. And um, so that was a fine line. It was really difficult to kind of uh, um, walk that, but um, um, it happened. And, and thankful for the police for their coordination and cooperation on, on that day as well. Very cool, and thank you for bringing up that that piece of it, like the the changes in social constructs and and feeling welcome, right? Um, there was a time where maybe that was acceptable, and now it's like, you know, if the cops are going to be here, I don't want to be here, and I and I totally understand that. So that working through that particular issue uh, uh, is not easy. Thank you so much for sharing that that piece of it, uh, Jen. You are up. Tell us about a learning or a particular challenge that was unexpected for you. Sure. Um, I mentioned the I expect challenge before. And moms, they don't believe they can do it. So I want to share something I learned from this project. First, I feel I should add another word, hunter, after my job title, community organizer, because community organizers are everywhere in our community. And also... During the process, I really hold a strong face in our community spirit because that matters the most during the most difficult time. Um, another thing is just try to think creatively about what you already have in your community, focusing on the strengths or individual talents that's already existing. Because when we think of that way, I feel it's already helped us transform the mindset 
you know, like from um, from a one-way service relationship between a community organizing team and community members to these collaborative relationships where residents and community organizers have a common goal shared and build this mutual trust and the re- and have this uh, decision making. Just think about um, by taking this initiative to share individual gifts and talents, the four moms demonstrate how a small but thoughtful project like this can build trusting relationships and a spirit of mutual care in their neighborhood. Love that, love that. Erica, I'll toss it back to you. Thank you. So just so everyone knows, we do have an opportunity and time for any uh, for a Q&A session. So if you have any questions that you'd like to ask any of our panelists, please feel free to put those uh, in the Q&A that's right under the bottom of your uh, panelist view where you can see all of us. There's an opportunity to put uh, questions in there and then we'll have those. Uh, we'll try to get those answered for you. All right. We do have a question that just popped up. So here's a question from Rich Weiss. Um, did your interaction with IOB and or neighbor up change how you approached or described your project to the people involved in it? Um, so we can go right back around this way. So, uh, Sheen, I'll start with you. Yes, I definitely think interaction with uh, neighbor up is definitely a change because we don't know this existing resources in the community and how do we encourage our residents to utilize what's already in the community and do something for themselves. Thank you. Um, Malaz and Angela, either one of you can start. Um, well, I want to first say that uh, IOBI as a, as a mission itself to be a community uh, funding, like a platform, it aligned so much with the work we were doing that it provided, for, for me at least, it, that credibility that this is a community project done by the community for the community. Um, so I feel like just having the, the fundraiser there is already tells people what is this project. This is like uh, for the community. And um, I, I have a, right now I have an active campaign with Ayobi that does also a community project. So it becomes my go-to place uh, that's a kind of a trusted platform for me to say, here it is. This is, a, this is immediately kind of tells what, that this is a community project and we are working on. So I feel that is one thing. The second part is the matching fund really accelerated our uh, work and in, in making us reach our goal faster and also kind of encouraged as well. We use that every time we talk to the people about the, the funding, it says that, you, that we have a matching fund. So uh, I feel like that also um, played part in letting the people or the community as well no, there is a, there is a, a greater value for their dollars than than what they um, present. Thank you, Angela. Did you- Nothing more to add. Okay, thank you, Julian. Um, again, my my experience was a little unique because we only uh, used ILB the second year. The first year we. Uh, we're working with Land Studio, and we only did two block parties on 119th and 128th. So the following year, um, there was some growing interest from neighboring streets, and we wanted to meet that need creatively. And, um, and so we uh, went for the uh, ILB um, uh, um, crowdfunding um, platform. Um, what I felt after the fact was that people were less likely to donate money to things they didn't know they needed. And so it just didn't make sense for us to start with ILB, I think at this point where, you know, we have some block parties where we're getting three, 400 people uh, at respectively, um, of course not this year, uh, but you know, in years previous, uh, when we have that, uh, that many people it made a lot more, it would make a lot more sense for us to launch a crowdfunding campaign when people have this collective experience connected to this, uh, to this series of, of events or whatnot that are happening in the neighborhood. So for me, 
um, that was my big takeaway from um, the crowdfunding around our project. Um, I didn't think it made sense in the initial phase because the way it was structured and what we were, uh, the voids we were addressing were significantly different. Um, but um, well, I don't want to say what, they were unique. And um, yeah, so that was pretty much my takeaway from that. Thank you. Um, so I do see a couple of questions um, directly related to IOB and crowdfunding. Um, so one question is for anyone who used IOB, uh, how did you go about starting up your IOB campaign? I think there's one question before that, which is um, for Angelo and me about what is the name of our organization? Oh, there you go. Yes. <laughs> uh, it is named... The name is Neighbors. <laughs> we don't have an organization. We're really a group of neighbors uh, who just live across the street from Riverview um, Towers. So we, we don't have a formal organization, not a nonprofit. We are a neighbor who really wanted to tell their neighbors that we care about you. And we wanted to do that in dignity and um, in, in love. So that's, that's our um, group. Uh, the nonprofit that uh, facilitated that, but I would think is IOB itself was our fiscal agent. And that's, uh, that we're thankful for that. We also reached out to local nonprofit to see if IOB wasn't going to be our fiscal agent uh, at the time, who could be our fiscal agent, whether it's OCI, High City Incorporated, or was it St. Paul's Church? And they, all of those organizations um, were very welcoming to that. But the fact that IOB had waived their fees for that period for all the COVID uh, response made it easier for us to just go with IOB. Uh, but we are a neighbor. We still continue to work as neighbors. We still don't have a nonprofit. So. And we, um, so <laughs> funny, there's someone who's on the call, but uh, they're on their phone, so they text me. And it's, uh, it's a similar question to the one that we have here um, from Don Dublin, and then um, also with Sonia Pryor Jones, who texts me um, the question about uh, how did you go about starting up um, with IOB? What barriers, if any, did you experience? And to that end, what Sonia asked was, is, um, that she struggled to meet her campaign goal and um, what are some key things you've done to reach your, um, your goal? Um, and uh, I know Julian and Malaz and Angelo have uh, all worked with IOB, so they could probably take a turn at those questions. I could jump in. Um, for me, um, I was just kind of uh, uh, understanding and growing with it as I as I went with it. Um, but I uh, I've seen other folks like run successful crowdfunding campaigns before. It just seemed so effortless for folks. I've always been very I have social media envy for folks who are able to just kind of throw these polls out and just get like two hundred thousand responses. You know, like uh, Tom, you're 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 always good with that sort of stuff. You know, I always wish that I was able to take a good barometer with uh, with folks that way. But um, I was hoping that when we had implemented the ILB campaign, um, that you know I would be able to garner that kind of response. And that's just not how my network works, and that's not how people respond to me. You know, and um, so. Um, we tried a different, uh, a couple of different approaches, and uh, to be honest, we were really just at capacity as far as like trying to see it all the way through. So we went a different route. But what I recognized after the fact was it really would have helped if I had done like a multi-tiered approach, if I had done video, and if I had done something, just kind of explain the program and, and the ideas that we had, and um, well, what we were planning to offset, and um, just help to build relationship with our, uh, with our. Um, uh, project, I felt like that would have really garnered a lot more, uh, um, um, you know, uh, funds and um, and support for what we were trying to do. And that was something that, um, you know, I still keep in my back pocket for uh, future crowdfunding efforts because I definitely see that as a uh, as um, maybe the uh, the end goal for this is for, for this to be totally community self sustained. You know, self sustained by the community and. Um, uh, for me, it, it, that's what I kind of took away from it was uh, um, it was all hands on deck. It was it was it was personal invites. It was social media blasts. It was emails. It was texts. It was a wedging in in the middle of phone conversations. It was 
uh, producing video clips. It was whatever it took. We had to do it because uh, it was that important to us, but we wanted to make sure that um, um, search engine optimization or, or algorithms weren't in our way, you know, and um, that's what we have to navigate in this digital space, you know, and um, um, so, yeah, all, clicking on all cylinders, if you can do that, uh, I think you'll, you're, you're, uh, you're primed for a successful uh, IOB campaign. Yeah. Uh, I always say, you know, the, the first thing is listen to your action strategist. Listen to me. Um, <laughs> give you all the tips and the tools and the tricks of the trade. And also form a team. If you, it's achieving a goal is great. You know, if you, if you want to go fast, you know, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. Um, so, it's really about like forming that team. So we are coming up on time and I'm going to uh, start our closeout. And so uh, as we wrap up today's program, I would like to thank Jen and Malaz and Angelo and Julian for joining us to talk about their experiences, uh, taking action in the community through organizing and fundraising. Uh, if you want to learn more about IOBI, I saw the slide. Uh, if you want to know more about IOBI and how we help resident leaders plan, start, and support neighborhood projects, uh, please visit our website at IOBI.org, or you can submit uh, your idea. Like, it takes, I promise you, it takes like 30 seconds to one minute just to submit an idea, and that's IOBI.org slash idea. I also invite you to join us at an upcoming webinar um, that we're hosting in partnership with Candid. It's on September 17th, uh, and we'll share some useful information about designing powerful crowdfunding strategies to diversify your fundraising. Um, the registration information is listed here on the slide, and we are offering a registration at a discounted rate of $25. Um, and now I'm going to hand it over to Erica, who will close out uh, with some information about upcoming Neighborhood Connections and Cleveland Foundation events. Thank you, Dawn. Uh, thank you to all of our panelists. Uh, in addition to fundraising, community network building is an important practice for resident leaders who want to make an impact in their neighborhoods. Neighborhood Connections hosts weekly community of practice learning exchanges to connect people who care about building community. We are hosting these virtually on Wednesdays uh, during this time. Tonight, it's at 6 p.m. You can find it on our website. Um, upcoming Neighborhood Action Clinics to help you take your idea into action and figure out how to build your team and what to do next. In addition to submitting your ideas to Dawn, you can also attend virtually. Uh, the next ones coming up are Monday, September 21st at 6 p.m., Tuesday, September 22nd at 10 a.m., and then we wash, rinse, repeat, Monday, October 5th, 6 p.m., Tuesday, October 6th at 10 a.m. Uh, information about these events is available on our website, neighborupclee.org, and also on our Facebook page. Uh, finally, if you're looking for something to do later this week, the Cleveland Foundation's annual meeting week continues with virtual events scheduled tomorrow and Friday. Tomorrow, you can join my colleague, Lila Mills, along with representatives from Cleveland Documenters and City Bureau for an open house workshop for the new Cleveland Documenter Program, Documenters Program, excuse me, which recruits, trains, and pays Greater Cleveland residents to document official committee meetings of the Cuyahoga County Council and City of Cleveland government. And on Friday, you can tune into the Robert D. Grease keynote lecture, which the Cleveland Foundation is hosting in partnership with the City Club of Cleveland. The virtual lecture will feature national leaders Karen Runlett and John Thornton in a conversation on the state of local journalism. Both events are free to attend and open to the public. You can find more information on both events at clevelandfoundation.org slash meeting. That wraps up our program for this afternoon. Thank you so much again to our panelists. Thank you to all of you who tuned in to be part of this conversation. Have a great day.